Robots are coming, and so is a jobs revolution. Estimates nearly 42% of jobs are at a high risk of being affected by automation in the next decade or two. We're going to see more and more things that look like science fiction, and fewer and fewer things that look like jobs. Automate Welcome back to Automate This. This is our deep dive into the future of work in an artificially intelligent world. Last week, machine learning expert Michael Osborne told us that almost half of all U.S. jobs could be at risk of automation, including a few you might not have considered. Waiters and waitresses, economists, fashion models. And machine learning isn't stopping there. According to Toronto's Brookfield Institute, we already have the technology to automate more than 40% of the tasks Canadian workers currently do at their jobs. Put another way, today's robots aren't just pushing buttons or building car parts, they're learning how to navigate rush hour traffic in a blizzard. And if you have a hard time wrapping your head around the idea of autonomous vehicles, try autonomous surgeons. This week, we're digging into the ways AI and machine learning are transforming the world of medicine. Healthcare is one of the fastest growing sectors in the tech industry. And yes, even surgeons may not be immune to job disruption. More on that later. The technology of the future could cost some hospital workers their salaries, but it will also save lives. In 2011, I was diagnosed with a form of cancer that proceeded to reoccur over the next five years. Um, and I think my treatment was considerably changed as a result of these technologies. That's Krista Jones describing how machine learning technology helped her become cancer free. She says AI technologies are far more advanced today than when she was diagnosed. And that gives today's patients a huge advantage. Probably would have saved me two surgeries, four years of heartache and, uh, and much more. Of course, radiology departments aren't the only place where smart machines are being put to work in today's hospitals. So once the robot unpulls the medications for one patient, it's gonna slide it over to the side where it's gonna bind it with a plastic ring. This is Rita Ju, director of pharmacy at the UCSF Medical Center in San Francisco, and she's describing one of the robots responsible for putting together her patient's daily medications. Puts on a front page for the of the medications with the patient's name and all the medications that are due according to the time. Rita's robots don't just dispense pills, they can also mix IV medications. And when it comes to mistakes, she says the robots have a far better track record than their human counterparts. The chances of the wrong drug that is put into the wrong package is almost zero. If you're curious to see these robots in action, check out the video we've put up on our website at cbc.ca slash day six. Of course, most pharmacies still rely on flesh and blood technicians, but Rita says it's just a matter of time until automation is more widespread. I think introducing automation and robots to the pharmacy industry is the only way we can get as close to making zero errors as possible. Rita's pharmacy robots do not come cheap. Each one costs more than a million dollars. But my next guest says that by 2030, hospital robots will be doing a lot more than dispensing pills. They will be operating on us and they will be totally autonomous. Dr. Peter Kim is a Canadian surgeon and the Associate Surgeon in Chief at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, DC. He's also part of a research team that's building an autonomous surgical robot, a robot that he says could eventually outperform human surgeons for some medical procedures. Dr. Peter Kim is in Washington. Peter, good morning, welcome to Day 6. Good morning, Brian. Peter, we just heard Rita Ju describing the robot employees at her pharmacy in San Francisco, but you want to take things a fairly gigantic step further because you're part of a team that's developing a fully autonomous robot that could perform surgery all on its own. What techniques do you think in the future could be done more efficiently by a robot surgeon that are still being done by humans now? I, I think the answer is all of the above. A lot of tools we have are really dumb, and then they are simple extension of smart humans. Surgical robot is a very good example. The robot itself isn't aware where things are in three-dimensional space, nor is it able to distinguish any tissues when it's actually in its operative setting. But in the future, smart technologies will be built within those tools. It will not only be aware where things are in the three-dimensional space, it probably will be aware of how things are doing 
The fact that these machines can perform more precisely, more accurately, and at the same time, you can put a lot of information in other words, it has a more bigger memory capacity. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine in the future, if you happen to need a surgery, you can potentially program the very best surgical techniques and judgments into a machine and have it available for everybody, essentially democratizing surgery. So tell us about the robot that you are developing. The robot is called STAR. What That's do you hope STAR will do? So STAR is a smart tissue autonomous robot. So this machine sees a little more than human visual spectrum would permit. And at mm. the same time, unlike what's available currently in the surgical suites, this machine is aware of where things are in three-dimensional space. So it has a situational awareness. Mm. And then by programming intelligence, for instance, how to do a particular surgical task, in this case, we happen to choose what we call anastomosis, that is putting together two ends of an intestine. And then we added a little bit of a touching or sensing capacity to this sort of machine. And when we compare this machine doing an anastomosis in a live uh, large animal model to the same procedures done by very experienced surgeons using open surgical tools and current robotic tools, to our surprise, this machine performed better than current human surgeons. In that test, was the STAR robot acting autonomously or was it acting with guidance from surgeons? So 60% of that was done completely autonomously and 40% was done supervised, meaning that robot would make a decision and then wait for a human supervision. But since then, we've done fully autonomous anastomosis as well. So, you know, you, you can imagine that you can expand into different parts of surgery where you require precision, including dissections, opening and closure, and so on. Do you imagine a day when an autonomous robot could do open heart surgery? I do. As in, and, and there are a couple of reasons why I'm, I'm very interested in this. Number one, that even with the best intentions today, there's a fairly significant incidence of complications and medical error. And I think this is one way to mitigate that. At the same time, I think there are places in surgery where humans can work with machines mm -hmm. to have a better outcome, less complications, and, and greater safety. Not everyone who is working in this field is convinced that the medical robots we already have are as effective as they're made out to be. Dr. Marty Makari is a professor of surgery at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. We spoke to him. He has some concerns about the way hospitals are using the non-autonomous da Vinci robot for some laparoscopic procedures, those keyhole procedures. Let's hear some of what he had to say, then we'll come back and talk. I think we saw too rapid an adoption of robotic surgery early in its introduction. No one really asked the question, is it better than standard laparoscopic surgery for a long time? And only after 15 years or so of the robot's uh, use, did we really start to understand its benefit? And its benefit is limited to a subset of operations, but there are a lot of areas where it's overused. So how can we justify rationing healthcare and at the same time using lavish, expensive devices that yes, have amazing technology, but have not been shown to benefit patients over the standard minimally invasive surgery? Dr. Peter Kim, how do you respond to what Dr. Makari is saying here, that we might be rushing to adopt technologies without assessing their real value. I think his point is well taken, and it is true. Many of the things he mentioned that the current state of technology, although it has been very enabling for small sections of surgical specialties, the, the actual cost of the technology itself is very prohibitive. Having said that, I think it's a very good first generation enabling technology. As we move towards the future, I think that more and more practitioners are thinking in a more selective applications mm -hmm. and coming into places where it does what it does better. But it really does look like there could be, especially if the rate of technological change is fast, that there could be a, a revolution in medical technologies. And patients aren't the only ones in this equation. Those technologies will affect hospital workers. So you are a surgeon. Are you worried that there'll come a time in the future, maybe the near future, that robots like the one that you're building could put people in the medical sector out of work? You know, I, I, I look forward to it, actually, if we can improve what I do as a surgeon. I welcome the opportunity of having smarter and smarter technologies that can enable me to provide a more consistent, more effective outcome, including 
smart surgical robots. So we are talking about robots and surgeries now, but what about family doctors? Do you see robots and AI replacing family doctors in the future? No, I'm not sure about replacing, but I think that it, it enhances us and providing better care. So it's very difficult being a family doctor because you have to know everything about everything all the time and then up, keep up to date with it. So the notion that some of these knowledges are within individuals, human beings, not being able to be programmed and being able to be available for everybody. I just think that's a sort of poor way of not only building knowledge, but transmitting it. Mm -hmm. So to provide a sort of a, a, a universal care of a highest quality, uh, technology is really an equalizer, democratizing agent here. Do you think about the rate of change? Do you, do you, when, when, you when you're working on your robot, do you imagine what is going to be need to be done ethically in order to introduce those kinds of surgeries to a human patient? Absolutely. I mean, our intentions are always sort of honorable and clear that we want the sort of very best benefits. But, you know, if you just look back, it's only been 10 years since the phone, you know, the iPhone came out and, and that revolutionized how we live life. And Internet's been only around for, what, 20, 30 years? Mm -hmm. so, rate at which things are changing, I think, is just unimaginable. And, and I think, for instance, the Star robot was selected by NASA as a one of the technologies they would like to acquire in the future. And, you know, they are planning to go to Mars in 13 years, 2030. Mm -hmm. I, I just can't imagine what it will be like even five, 10 years from now. Do you think you're going to send Star to Mars when that mission happens in 2030? Well, they'll need it. You know, you can't come back if you've got some surgical emergencies. And then you can't phone. It will take you half an hour to call somebody. So... I think in their wisdom, it would be smart for them to get one of, one of ours. You better get Star's consent first. <laughs> yes. Dr. Kim, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Dr. Peter Kim is a Canadian surgeon and the Associate Surgeon in Chief at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. If you'd like to see the robot pharmacists at the University of San Francisco, California in action, we've posted a video of the robots on our website. For that and much more from our series Automate This, head to cbc.ca slash day six. Automate this. If and when we all lose our jobs to machines, we can always take up painting. But even the creative sectors aren't immune to the changes that are coming. Okay, hands up if you think Poem 1 was written by a human. Computer programs are already capable of writing haikus, composing Beatles-style pop tunes, and even building convincing CGI movie stars. In part three of Automate This, we're asking how AI could reshape the media from pop music to blockbuster films. You can imagine a AI taking a movie and editing 500 different versions of it and A-B testing those in real time so that they can see which version it performs the best. That's coming up next week on Day 6. And if your job is changing thanks to robots or anything else, we want to hear about it. Subscribe to the CBC Radio Work Shift newsletter and you can get the chance to share your story with the nation in your own words. It's all written by you. Head to cbc.ca slash workshift to find out how. <laughs>